amazing joy to tell you that I haven't got my words that I want to say, so can you just hold on a moment while I find them? <laughs> I've been talking so much since I got here, and I met Angie, Alan's mum, on the way here. I recognised her, and I chat, 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 and she said to me, breathe. So I'm here, I am now breathing to get some words. glad to know that these words are going to keep me brief because anyone who knows me will know that I could talk for England about COAs because it's um, a very favourite subject. So here we are today and it's the 10th COA week in the UK um, which I'm very proud of and this year has been immense and amazing um, and this year we included people in India and they are now setting up in the Koa, India. Um, and I think Piers may have shown me some photographs before time. And they've been doing things like sand art. And they've been having dancing on beaches. And they're talking in India about the, the work that we're doing here. Um, and it's been a really great pleasure to work with them because that's what Nicole is about. Nicole is about sharing. So the whole world knows about this stuff and also has perhaps a model to work from so they can adapt it because this is what we've been doing for 29 years. Um, we have four fantastic speakers here today and you'll recognise all of them and it really is a, a great, great delight to, to welcome them and to welcome all of you too. This started back in actually about... 1988, I think, um, when David Stafford and I ended up working together at a treatment centre called St Joseph's Centre for Addiction in Hazelmere in Surrey. And this was run by the Daughters of the Cross at Holy Cross Hospital. And a great joy is to welcome Sister Mary Agnes here today because she's been with us since the beginning. Um, <laughs> She's, she's been here forever <laughs> and, and it's just such a joy and she has and they have been so supportive of our work and sadly St Joseph's has closed <coughs> but the work of Nicoa goes on and so I, you know I, I think that somehow or another some, something went on at that place and you provided that place for the five of us to get together to do this so thank you for that it will never be forgotten and what has happened in the last four years, I've been trying to do my maths since 2015, when Liam wrote to me and said that he would really like to help in some way. Since then, it's been a roller coaster, an absolute roller coaster for both NACOA and for COAs everywhere, and for COAs worldwide, because lots of people now are talking about this. And my, um, my take on it is that now if people ask me what I do and I tell them, they understand the problem and they also understand what we do and how important that is. So um, what do we do, Liam? APPG, First Worldwide Manifesto for Change on COAs, um, Children of Alcohol Dependent Parents being made a priority for Public Health England and then the £6 million funding, which will provide services. So this has been an incredible four years, and, and I have to say, without Liam, I don't think this would have happened. I know it wouldn't have happened. Um, but I really, really appreciate your skills as a politician, Liam, but actually it's your humanness which has actually made this happen, and the humanness of all these people who are sitting here today. So David Stafford and I met at the treatment centre and, and he'd arrived in post when I was in America um, at the Karen Foundation, uh, which is a foundation um, where they provide treatment for children of alcoholics. And I'd gone because in my own personal life I, I, I kept finding contradictions, things that as a child I promised myself I would never do. And, and, and those convictions were within me, but somehow or another, with some things, I was maybe not doing what I'd said I wouldn't do, but I was doing something very similar. So I took myself off to America, and it changed my life. Um, and I saw a sculpt, that people just using human bodies to actually create what 
a family can look like where there's problems with alcohol or drugs or any other addiction, really. And it changed my life because what it did for me is it gave me a framework to understand where I was coming from and also really to sort of forgive myself for not being the perfect person that I, I thought I could be as long as I did everything opposite to what had happened to me. And I, so I met David, and he called me into his office because he was um, the director, and chat, chat, chat. And then I said to him, David, we have to do this work. This is, this is extraordinary. So, okay, he said, do a lecture to the staff, which I did. And I could see that he was really interested, but he didn't say anything to me uh, about himself. Um, so then we went on and we did some conferences, and Sue's here, and she remembers those. Um, and we, you know, networked with lots of people in the field. And I have to tell you that some people thought we were crazy people. And also, some treatment centres told us that we were doing this was too dangerous. How could people possibly get sober if they had to think about this as well? And the answer to that is that some people need to do this work before they can get sober. Um, so we worked together on this, um, and also what we had begun to see was that people were coming back, having relapsed, um, coming back into treatment. And, and what they were saying was that they couldn't maintain their sobriety within their families. And whereas, you know, the tradition then was to say, oh, that's just another excuse. Do you know something? It, it's a reality when the family haven't had any treatment, haven't had any help or support, haven't had that quiet moment that, that time away from everything, to actually look at what was going on. And a landmark moment was when um, I was working with families uh, one Sunday, and we were looking at the Jelinek chart, which looks at the progression um, that drinking can take. And we, we were looking at it so families began to understand a bit more of the mechanics. And actually what happened was, people were saying to me, but I despaired. But I did. I worked more. I didn't drink more, but I worked more. I isolated myself. I used work or I used something to just keep myself from thinking. And it was a, I've, I've still got the flip chart sheet somewhere at the cover because it really was one of those epiphany moments. So sometime later, um, David popped his head around my door and said... My brother goes to ACOA in the States, and he walked away. And I thought, have you just told me, after all these months, that you're the child of an alcoholic? And the answer was yes. And that's how difficult it is. David went on to write two brilliant books, uh, One Count Codependency and Children of Alcoholics, uh, the first books um, written, uh, 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 British books, about this subject. And in one of them he wrote, although sadly I haven't got the book now, someone's borrowed it, um, he said, I don't know whether to love you or hate you for getting me into this. And it's only when I was thinking about today that I thought, this, what's this? <laughs> and this is a thing. And we now know, through Josh's brainchild, COA is a thing, that COA is a thing. And I think now more people are talking about this subject and can hear about this subject too. Uh, David's work, and lots of David's family are here today. I can sort of see some of you, but not all of you. So a very special welcome to you. And, um, you know, all these years later, 22 years after his death, his work lives on in the helpline and through us all. That's absolutely for sure. I also know for sure that he would be as proud as Punch. Um, and I think he would also love to be sitting where I am today with these four amazing people. So I think it's a really nice time to remember David and to remember, you know, what together we started. But it, it was a, you know, a time when the right people got together in the right place. And so I'm very grateful for that. I'd like now to introduce you to Liam who really has taken the world by storm. Um, he, he, he talks about having made the most difficult speech of his life, and when you think of how many speeches this man has made, that's how difficult this stuff is to talk about. He actually said once 
that having talked to me, he almost decided not to talk about this stuff. And I have to say, that was not my intention. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of didn't know if that was good or bad. But actually, I remember the conversation, which because I think Liam said, why don't people talk about this stuff? And I said to him, because by very definition, it's not only our story. We are always also talking about other people's stories too. So, but Liam didn't take, that wasn't my advice, but Liam, you know, went off and, 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 you know, has taken the world by storm. And I am so grateful to him today. And COAs throughout the world are grateful to him today for talking out loud about this very difficult subject. Liam. Thank you. No, 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 this was my idea. <laughs> there's, you know, there, there's only, you know, for me, um, the the debt I owe that is greatest is to, is to Nakoa and to Hillary, and I'd like you to ask you now to join me in saying just a massive thank you to her and the whole team. Uh, so I remember um, when I gave the first one of these talks, I said that all change start, all revolutions start with a few small people in a small room. And now three years later, we've had to book the biggest room in the House of Commons to fit all of you in. And that is um, so it's, it has been a roller coaster. Um, and so we just thought, as a way of saying thank you to you, um, we would just give you a very quick clip, uh, it's just a minute and a bit, of what some of that roller coasters look like. Hopefully you can see it, hopefully you can hear it. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. No. I'm going to talk it through. So my inspiration, Caroline Flint, she kind of started it off for me. Um, Caroline had talked about it for some time. Oh, are, you going to, are you going to stop and replay? Yeah. It's a good job we stop live, isn't it? Brilliant. I've learned all live they do this. So yeah, so Caroline Flint was the person who kind of gave me the strength originally um, to talk about this. And then I was saying to Callum, this is my, that was my, just, just let it play, I'll talk it over. Um, when I um, talked about it for the first time in the, in the Commons, um, I was just a complete stumbling mess. Um, and I thought about it, look, a mess. Uh, barely, able to, barely able to cohere. Um, and then as, as one thing led to another, we realised that we were going to have to part, start putting together um, statistics, we would start we'd have to put together events here in the Commons, um, and we needed partners in the, in the media. So Camilla is here, Camilla and others have been absolutely brilliant. And then that's when we realised we would have to bring people together to write um, this first manifesto, for which those of you who haven't got it, um, it's at the bottom. That allowed us to then go onto the media with brilliant people like Josh. Um, and what we, you know, what we found is that there was a whole network of us out there in the media um, who wanted to help us share the message. Then we got Parliament to put some serious research behind it, and then we were blessed with John Ashworth, who not only runs marathons, yeah. but made it a front bench commitment for us. <laughs> to change this there he is. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. And then John was brave enough to talk about his story in the House of Commons, and then um, you're about to see something that none of us have ever seen before, which is a Minister of the, the Crown reduced to tears at a dispatch yeah. box. Um, as Nicola Blackwood has just gone into the House of Lords, that then gave us the impetus to go and see Jeremy Hunt, um, who was then the Secretary of State for Health, um, who was the first person to actually um, put together a national children of alcoholic strategy. And that is what has brought us here today. So funding for pilots, support for Helpline, Minister in charge, we think that we've got about half of what we set out to do <laughs> delivered. And so when we launched this, the message loud and clear was to all children of alcoholics, 
thank you for helping get this done. But above all, today your voice has been heard. That is what we originally set out to do, and that is what you have helped make happen. Now, um, the only, there's only two other things, really, that I wanted to, to say by way of introduction. So, none of us, none of us chose our fate. But we did choose to come together to change that fate for ourselves, for others, and for our children. Everyone in this room knows that that path is a hard path. Everyone knows that on that path you get tired, thirsty, hungry, cold, lonely, depressed, sad, pissed off. And that is why the power of this movement is the strength that we give to each other. I would absolutely not be here if it wasn't for Hillary, but I wouldn't be here without Callum's incredible bravery and Callum's incredible book. All of a sudden, I found a language and a concept. The book is called Second Best. That is suddenly what I realized I felt. And that was the key for me beginning to understand that actually I wasn't worthless. I wasn't second best. Actually, I was a person in my own right. It's only with the strength of people like Tony standing up constantly, constantly giving those talks, that we're able to deliver on our basic strategy, which is to break the silence so that we can break the cycle. And I think we're beginning to succeed in that. And because we want change, we need political change. And that's why John's strength and courage has been so important in kind of cutting through the tremendous personal pain and agony that we all know about, but actually turning it into a plan of action, a plan of change, and then crucially, to keep going on about it over and over and over again until change is actually delivered. So really, that is my key message today. This is, this is a team effort like nothing else. It's a team effort, and we're only halfway through the manifesto that we set out to write together and deliver together. We have still got many miles, many miles still to go, but together we will get to the end of that road because together we learn that we couldn't change things for our parents, but God help us, we'll change things for our children. Thank you very much. Indeed. John do have to go later for a vote, so what we've decided to do is after each session, perhaps just have a qu couple of questions. So has anyone got any questions for Liam, or would you like us just to move swiftly on? Let's crack on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, I've got to... I'm about what other things that are still to be done. Yeah, so, so we do an annual survey um, each year, and... I'll give the, it's got good news and bad news, basically. So, so the good news is that three years ago, there was no local authority in Britain with a strategy for children of alcoholics. None. Now, there are 60%. That is extraordinary. That is absolute. I've, ne you know, I've been doing this job 15 years. I've never seen a basic change in strategy like that. That's the good news. Bad news. Alcohol admissions due to a and, uh, alcohol admissions into uh, alcohol-related A and E admissions this year, 39,000 higher than 10 years ago. Yet the budgets for addiction not going up, going down, and in some places going down very sharply. So we've got mind share amongst people and frontline professionals in a way that we frankly could not have hoped for. But you know, money has to meet the mind share in order to make the real kind of difference. So what government did is they gave some money over for pilots for children of alcoholic strategy. That is a good thing. Um, money for helpline, fingers crossed, coming online soon. That's a good thing. That'll allow NACOA to expand the amount of education work um, that it does. But we have still got, um, I think, a long way to go in some of the system factors that we know need bringing under control. So, 
alcohol promotion to children, for example. Um, minimum alcohol pricing, for example. You know, underway in Canada, Scotland, elsewhere. You know, that we still haven't delivered here. Um, and just much more explicit aims um, for reducing overall levels of alcohol harm. So, you know, I, I suppose I'm surprised at how much progress we made so quickly. I mean, that is partly down to John's work on the front bench. Um, money has not yet matched that shift in mindshare. And, you know, in our business, money is the root of all progress. Um, so that, that, that battle still continues. Do you want another question? Yeah, okay. Liam, thanks very much. Uh, I've been thinking back about 20 years to the old National Institute of Social Work. And the last national survey they did for children and families, social departments, 78% of the cases involved parental drinking. Mm. Now, I've still quite a bit of contact with social workers and youth workers. Virtually none of them are trained or required to be trained. Mm in helping families with an alcohol problem. How can we get that on the professional agenda for those two crucial professions? Yeah, so we think that the pilots out there give us a chance actually to kind of wander around, see what works, see what doesn't work. And you know, what I really hope we were able to do this time next year is bring back some of those frontline leaders who have been working on the pilot to base on the pilots to basically share with us what some of their experience was. So I am not a public health professional, but you know I do know how to make public policy change happen. And so the fact that we've now got metrics for who's doing, who's got strategy, who's not got strategy, who's got money, who's not got money, that the next step is for us to basically boil down, okay, what are the kind of five or six key success factors that we've learned from the pilots that are really important and which we can now expect and insist are prevalent everywhere. That's the, <laughs> that's the method in the madness here. <laughs> Um, in also, the meantime, people can have an information from professionals leave it, give it to every social worker you know, I guess. It's a bit excellent. ground up and yeah. it's working the other way. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Lee. Yes. Also, the NGOs, uh, some of the NGOs who have part of the million, they're actually looking at training programmes. Yeah. So right. I, think, I think things are happening. It may not be quite as fast as you like, but as Cassie quite rightly said, um, we do have information for teachers and information for professionals, so please feel free to take any literature you want. Liam, thank you very much indeed. No doubt we'll hear more from you later. Um, but now uh, it's my great joy to introduce Tony Adams to you. And if I were to tell you, you know, even a little teeny, teeny bit about the life of Tony Adams, it, it, it's enormous and it's huge. And I have to tell you this, I did not know how famous you were. <laughs> uh, until yesterday. <laughs> really sorry, but that's. <laughs> I did, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do you know something? I, I, this is a living legend. Keep going. <laughs> he's, got, he's captain Arsenal and England more times than anyone else. He is one of Arsenal's. <laughs> Best players ever. He's got 60 60 England caps. Um, and there's more. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Shall I get up? No. Yeah. <laughs> but the best thing about Tony Adams to me is that when he was asked in 2002 to become an ACOA patron, he said yes. <laughs> And it's a great thing because I, I know that Tony does not lend his name out very easily. Um, and what Tony has done is he swapped his England caps for the Nakoa t-shirt <laughs> that he now sports on the slopes and wears everywhere. He is also a great, great advocate for this work. And also, if I may say so, Tony, he's been there and he survived incredibly difficult odds. And he's still here, and he's still smiling, and what he wants to do is always to give children the information that they are not responsible for their parents' drinking. So, the very famous, and our legend now, Tony Adams. Hey.
Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Is that on? Yeah. Can, yep, all good. Um, yeah, I came last year and um, uh, sat in the audience and uh, straight afterwards I, um, I emailed Hillary and said, why am I not up there? <laughs> um, I'm slightly regretting doing that now. Um, no, I'm, uh, uh, what is my, yeah, 2002. 2002. Um, you asked me how long, I was six years into recovery uh, and um, I was setting up, I set up my own charity in 2000 and I was looking for other charities that kind of piggybacked or aligned with it um, and it was perfect um, because a little bit about my story, you probably you all, hopefully you may know it, I'm a little boy scared to death and couldn't speak when I was five, panic attacks and all this. Um, and now that I can't shut up. So um, I'm doing this kind of talk quite a bit. Um, and yeah, um, I think in 96, when I kind of, I had 12 years of drinking, I'm a recovering addict, recovering alcoholic. And you know, every time I get up, I feel like they're gonna boo. <laughs> they go, boo you, it was you, you know, I was that dad. I was that dad, you know, I had 12 years of drinking and uh, brought three children into the world. and. Uh, I remember couple, just a couple of bits, you know, I part, we took them out one at the end of my drinking in 96, and I just did 96, um, I was spending a lot of time in pubs and clubs, so I, I married a, um, a barmaid, and uh, her drug of choice was crack cocaine, and it started off of recreational cocaine, moved on to crack cocaine within three, four years of the relationship. I put her into treatment, I know the guy from Clout is here today, but I stuck her into treatment and said, sort your life out. I drove her down there drunk out of my head, and I said, at least I'm not as bad as you. Not as not as and I had three tears, and I tried to look after three children, being a, a drunk, um, uh, a Ill, a very ill man, emotionally and mentally, and uh, I had trauma as a kid, and a lot of stuff. I was completely unconscious of all this stuff at the time, but now it's, uh, you know, it's all, you know, 22 years now without a drink and, and in therapy for that long and um, I started to get it all up and out and um, good to see a few men in the room I'd like a few more to be honest with you but this stuff when I got sober it's uh, um, you know we didn't do my family didn't talk about it you know we didn't talk about stuff it wasn't a family where we sat in the evening and said hey you fool thoughts and feelings you know this is what this illness is about you know, and I didn't sit around and say, oh, I had a bad day at school today, I had a panic attack, I couldn't read, but everyone was taking the mickey out of me. We didn't do that type of thing. And, and my parents were my parents. You know, they were, without taking their infantry, they were, um, you know, my mum was sugar, very big, large lady. I was, I was probably ashamed and embarrassed by her, to be honest with you, because she was so big and that had a, an effect on me. And my dad smoked himself to death, lung cancer. You know, and rageaholic, you know, everyone, if you had a bad day, you, you would keep out of the way, you know, and uh, his father before, and I've forgiven all these people, because, you know, his father before him, he, you know, he was a drunk, a complete drunk, come at my dad with a knife, you know, so he's had issues before that, but it's got to me, and I, I vowed I'd never take a drink, and my dad come to me once, um, went in the heart of my drinking, and uh, said, you're a drunk, son, you're embarrassed, embarrassed to the family. You know, you're embarrassed, you know, you've been in prison, you've done this, you've done that. You know, can't you just sort your life out? What is wrong with you? You know, I didn't know, he didn't know, you know, and uh, fast forward that, I, I got into recovery and I took him out and I made amends and I've forgiven my father, he passed away in 2002, but, you know, I kind of forgiven him and uh, I sat down with him and I said, look, Dad, all the pain that I caused you, I'm really, really sorry. Um, all the embarrassment, all the stuff, you know, I was kind of tucked away in prison. You were the one that, that uh, um, took all the front line stuff. And he said, I won't have it, you know, you're not, a, you're not a drunk. You know, so I knew at that point that it's not about him, really. It was about me. And, uh, yeah, I, I fell asleep. Um, I was looking after them three children. And one Sunday afternoon, I went to an Indian. Uh, I had about four or five bottles of Chablis. And I was topping up from the night before. And I passed out on the sofa. Um, and the three kids, 18 month, four, and, uh, and my eldest was nine. Um, and thank God, my nine-year-old, um, you know, she called my mother-in-law. Um, you know, she would take it back. And hopefully, she would have called Nicola or sent an email. That that never you couldn't. It wasn't possible to do that in in you know in '96 in those days. And, 
you know, she got them to talk to my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law did her best, but some kids have not got that support. Luckily, she came round and smacked me around the face a few times to sort yourself out, you drunk. And uh, off she went and took the three kids off of me. You know, I did a, a little bit more research. I had a little bit more research before I finally, uh, finally threw the towel in. And uh, 96, I, I sobered up. And what I'm trying to say, my message is, it's a family illness, you know. And, and, I think it's, it's uh, um, you know, it's been it's been the best thing ever done. I, I've got six children now, two grandchildren. Uh, we talk about our thoughts and feelings, um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, my three eldest, um, like I say, they didn't they, they saw a little bit of a um, little bit of the mess, and. Um, Oh, I think you're really emotional. It's good, huh? It's good. <laughs> it's nice stuff, this. Thanks for this. I get loads out of this. So yeah, I'll go away jumping down the street. <laughs> Dump all my stuff on you lot. It's brilliant. Um, if you can handle it. It's great. Yeah, it's good therapy. I won't have to get my therapist. Right. <laughs> uh, job done. Um, so yeah, I got in, I involved in, in 2002. I think originally I was patient together with my wife this morning. Mo Moland, I think, was patron at the time yeah, in '96, yeah, and she wrote yeah. me a lo lovely letter when I got sober. Um, did she? Yeah, she did. Uh, which I've still got, and uh, we were we kind of oh, you know, that's a really cracking idea. You know, that is a fantastic idea, and I thought oh, and uh, I've been busy setting up my own charity and uh, maybe not give it the time and and uh, I came home from China two years ago and after having a, a mental breakdown and emotional brain and you know tears I was sharing earlier um, best life in the world you know but I had all these I, I three stents put uh, two stents put in my chest and uh, uh, it frightened the life out of me it frightened it put me into you know I was scared of dying and um, I just, it psychologically just got me, you know, and like I said, I've got f six fantastic children, a wonderful wife, and emotionally we talk about stuff, we ain't got a, you know, free as a bird, absolutely free as a bird, and I'm sitting there crying like a baby, I'm crying like, like a baby, you know, and I'm like, oh. you know, luckily I've got a support network today, you know, and, and, and the car, when I came home, I kind of tried to reconnect, and I think I, I reconnected with Nakara and said, okay, you know, use me or I'm out. You know, <laughs> and uh, I think it's, you know, it's, yeah, you've used me. Um, but I, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. I'm really grateful that the awareness is there today. Like, it, it's better than ever. Yeah, there's a lot more we can do. Um, but it's a fantastic phone line. I just, just my, we've got a lady that, we've got several, but uh, sit on the Sporting Chance um, helpline. And... It's, it's incredible what I couldn't do it. I, one guy, when I was in Azerbaijan, one guy phoned me up and said he was going to top himself. And uh, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know where to do what, what to do. You know, you don't know what to do. And these, these guys get in them emails, they're getting them, them phone calls all the time. And the frontline stuff is, you know, luckily we've got Emily that signposts them. We've got 7,000 calls during the um, sex abuse cases and to signpost them all to 553 or something into one-to-one -one therapy was, was amazing. And these guys got 37,000 calls from, from kids five into whatever, you know. It's, it's amazing the work and the, and the, 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 about the, the, I can talk all day about this stuff. I'm gonna shut up, but I'm really pleased that you did ask me and I'm really pleased that I sent that email. And uh, yeah, God bless you and you're doing some great work. Thank you. Keep up the good work. being so famous. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting that you talked about um, suicide and the study we did, I mean, very many years ago now, but um, huge, huge uh, study of 4,000 4, respondents um, found that children of alcoholics are three times as likely to consider suicide both as children and as adults. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, and uh, the numbers are really impressive, I think. But actually, I think what is, for me, if, if you can just help one or two or three or four children, all of this is worth it. 
um, and, and you know, and that has been made possible by by all of you and uh, by our amazing volunteers. Um, has anyone got any questions for Tony? Although Tony will not have to go off for the parliamentary bell, so he can stay. You may be able to talk to him personally later if you. Ben, Ben, Tony, you're, you're talking there. Yeah. Was that while you were Arsenal? Was that the drinking culture at Arsenal? And were you the leader, or you know, because it's fairly well written there was a drinking culture. I think. I think that there was, and, and we found in sport, and it's not really very quickly, um, that they've changed their drug of choice to gambling now. There's an epidemic in the, in the sporting world. Um, yeah, so they've uh, um, swapped it, and alcohol's gone a little bit out of the game. But definitely, you know, I was used to it. First time I put beer in my mouth, you know, I, I spew, if I took brandy, I'd spew it up. You know, you go, oh, leave it alone then. No, put it in the, brand, put it in the Guinness, and it stays down. It's insanity. It's insanity. So, um, yeah, so I, I practiced how to, to drink rubbish, um, to Do be honest. Do you think you were the major influencer in that drinking culture? Oh, I wanted or everyone to be as sad as me. I wanted, a bit, I wanted to make everyone as sad as me. You know, I was dragging them, I was coming out to play, you know. I got all my mates divorced. I got, I got, I got no, I need a lot of amends. I've done, I've done most of them. I've said sorry to a lot of them, but you know, I was just dragging them out. Wait, come into the next morning, and you're lonely, insecure, sad. Your all the EBGBs come up, thoughts and feelings, and I couldn't handle that sober, so I had to get drunk all the time. I had to get drunk all the time. It never showed on the pitch. You were one. I played drunk three times. Um, Swindon away, and I asked the manager to come off. Um, and uh, uh, Everton away, and I did the same thing. And he said, "Oh, thanks for trying." But it was people were drinking very heavily in those days as well. And once I got man of the match, how confusing is that? <laughs> <laughs> for Sheffield United, I got a silver set, silver knife and spoons. I'm looking out the window on the way home, going, "What's what's all this about? How is how is this happened?" You know, because I was I'm scared. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead behind you. Um, We've got the. So, I just want to try and understand how difficult it is when you first start to stand up in public. And yeah. Share what you've got to say and what you've got to say. You've done some stuff that yeah. you're not proud of. Just my experience, what, yeah. what, what I did, my experience is I was six weeks clean and sober when I, when I actually told them my working colleagues. I thought it was, it was very. Um, uh, lethargic, you know, you kind of got rid of everything. I wasn't living a lie because I was a running joke, you know, falling off the wagon, falling off the wagon every week, you know, oh, he's drunk again, he's drunk again, oh, here he goes again, you know, so, so I was like the running joke at work type of thing. So I, I, I knew I had it, I knew I'd surrendered, and I was going to AA regular. Um, regular meetings, they suggest you do 90 and 90 at the start. I was going to more, I was in London, I couldn't play because I was all over the place. But I, I was going to loads and loads of meetings and I was cleaning, so I did. We talk about the guys when they come out of treatment, you know, when you, you declare your anonymity and stuff. That's the only reason I got the sporting chance because I know about all that stuff that I don't, you know, and it sometimes does a hell of a lot of harm. If you go out there and use again, you know, what message that's given out to everybody or use, you know, these people, the dads have heard it all before, the families, the wives heard it all before, you know, the four guys that just come out before Christmas, they've all got girlfriends and stuff and they're going, do I, you know, I'm sober, I'm clean now, I've just come out of treatment, I'm going to, I said, whoa, whoa, slow down. Well, like I say, I work six weeks after doing daily therapy, um, and I've got a therapist as well um, that I was seeing. Um, then to the my my network of children and, and family members. Obviously, my wife had left me. Oh, rejection! That's painful. I needed a drink on that one. But when I got sober, I didn't go to AA meetings. It's weird that. Um, but I started going through the twelve-step process of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and after two years. In the, and it, I think it's a daily, daily amends to my children. Um, just the fact that I'm clean and sober and I don't act the way that I used to emotionally and mentally. You know, sometimes I did like last weekend, my 12 year old, um, we've, we've had a, I was like a baby. You know, I was feeling lonely, insecure and all this stuff. So I try to make him bad as well. You know, I try to make him feel bad. And he went, dad, you're a moron. What is wrong with you? <laughs> and then, I said, well, and then, 
my wife said to him, apologise to your dad. And I, he apologised, and I went, oh, I don't care. <laughs> you know, looking like, like a child. You know, so emotionally, I mean, now, maybe not 100%, but we act differently today. So it took, it takes time. It just takes time, you know, and you have to be patient and, uh, and keep practising, keep opening the mouth. It's been my, it's been my saviour, opening the mouth. Um, my next pleasure is to, to introduce John Ashworth and uh, to be honest John I don't keep up with politics and um, the first time I heard of you was, was in a text an early morning Sunday morning text from Liam saying to me the Shadow Health Minister, John Ashworth, has just endorsed your work. Wow, I thought. So fortunately, Piers and Cassie were staying at the time, and I ran into their bedroom and said, and they realised how extraordinary this was, and actually how extraordinary you have been, both to us and, and for children of alcoholics. Um, I know John has also talked about having made the most difficult speech of his life, and again, we can imagine only how many speeches he's made. And, and I, I looked up a bit of Hansard, because I remembered there was something you said, and you said, when I spoke out in the media over Christmas, this must have been perhaps 2016 or perhaps even 17, entirely by accident, by the way, I was asked a question and sort of blurted it out. And afterwards, I was inundated by people getting in touch with similar stories and saying that they remembered leaving their parent in the morning to go to school, never knowing whether they would be the same person when they got home that night. And that sort of resonated for me, and again, because I, I know how difficult talking about this stuff is, and just how extraordinary you, you four are at, at doing that. Um, but, you know, the, the interviews you've given, the, I mean, you're everywhere, John, and, and you know, it, it has been like a roller coaster, hasn't it, Liam? I mean, it's all been, but I do think that it's sort of like not gone on a straight line, but actually so many people working together has meant it's sort of grown exponentially and, and you know, now we are being heard. Um, also, John has run the London Marathon twice for us already. <laughs> Hooray! Um, raising, yay! Okay, so, um, and I think it totals about £17,000. And even better news, John is running the London Marathon for us again this year. <laughs> <laughs> bad news is I have all your email addresses <laughs> and I will e be emailing you with his Just Giving page and asking you to make a donation, um, i.e. there is no such thing as a free House of Commons lecture. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and, you know, truly, I'm laughing about money, but I have to say money is always a bugbear at Nakoa. Um, John's also visited Nakoa twice, and what he, uh, what he did on one occasion was, uh, it was quite a low-key affair, we had our volunteers there, we, there were quite a few of us there, and John sat, we've got a big round table, he sat, and there is actually a really wonderful photograph of him leaning forward, and he's listening, I think, to Cassie, and I can see Abby there, and there's Steph there, and you are listening, it's the most beautiful photograph, and listening from your heart. Um, I know your people were desperately trying to get you to go and you, you kept not going and uh, that meant a lot. But what it also meant was that John coming to Nakoa actually gave one of our callers the courage to ask for help from her own MP. Because what she saw on the social media stuff was actually John wearing one of her loom bands as well, I have to say, and actually, when she came across a, a, a roadside bus where an MP was, she went in and said, what's this about them? And they said, your MP's here. And she said, well, what do you want to talk about? Uh, you know, what, what, what's it about? Oh, we're, we're here to listen to issues. And she said, I've got lots of issues. And I have to tell you, and this is absolutely true, um, this, this young girl, she's been in touch for very many years, she'd lived in a very, very abusive home where her dad drank, her mother was 
completely consumed by actually how slim her daughters were. The other daughters have um, eating disorders. And she lived, she's a vulnerable adult. She, she doesn't work. Um, and she needed to get out of that house, but she couldn't. Um, and after talking to her MP, having seen this photograph of John wearing a loom band, listening, she is now in sheltered accommodation. And that is what changes lives. Yeah. And it won't only change lives for her, it will change lives for her children and her children's children. And that's how important this work is. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart, John. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you very much. And, um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here this afternoon. And uh, thank you all of you for coming along this afternoon. I can entirely understand, Hilary, why you, why you wouldn't perhaps have heard of me. I'm just an obscure politician, but not really quite realising you're Tony Adams. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't be offended. Um, um, yeah. you know, I mean, you do know who Callum's dad was, don't you? Yeah. Just, 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 just checking. I'm dad age, yeah. Just, you now know, just, just checking. But uh, I, I am so honoured to be here, and I am so delighted to be associated with this campaign and with uh, NACOA. I, I think the achievements and the progress we've made so far I think it's one of my, it is, no, it is not one of my, it is my proudest uh, accomplishment in politics, I would say. Um, and that is hugely because of your leadership, Liam, and the leadership that Caroline, who's not here, Caroline Flynn showed. And it was you and Caroline who, when you spoke out, that you inspired me to speak out. And I, and I was, uh, I decided to speak out, really, when I was appointed the Shadow Health Secretary, because... I thought to myself, when you were the Labour Health Secretary, the Shadow Health Secretary, you know, you, by our nature, this isn't a partisan event, but you know, we will go on the TV and we'll complain about the state of the hospitals and the A and E's and crisis and all the and all the rest of it, and that's what Labour Shadow Health Secretaries do. But I also thought I've got this extraordinary platform and opportunity um, to say something about something which has been uh, eating away at me inside for some time. And, Although I actually did blurt it out by accident in an interview which wasn't supposed to be about being a child and an alcoholic because it was obviously playing on my mind. I'm I am pleased uh, that I did. I didn't expect to then decide to run a marathon uh, for Nicola and then run a second marathon uh, for Nicola. I have to, have to be honest with you, I, I am so proud to be associated with Nicola, but when I'm at about mile 16 and 17, I'm going, bloody Nicola, why am I doing this? <laughs> And when I finish the London Marathon, I always say, I'm never going to do that again. It's horrendous. You have. You said that. Well, two time. weeks ago, I entered <laughs> the London Marathon. And I will be running the London Marathon for the third, for the third time. Um, it's great to be on this platform. I thought your remarks were absolutely phenomenal. I think we talk about, at events like this, how, how brave it is to stand up as a child of an alcoholic and uh, offer your story and uh, tell a few anecdotes about how it affects you. I think... So to saying that you were an alcoholic parent yeah. takes phenomenal so courage. Yeah. And I just want to pay tribute to them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so pleased you emailed in and uh, uh, got yourself on this platform uh, to, speak, to speak. And I'm really, really pleased and excited to be on the platform with you, Tom, because as I, was, um, as I was saying to Callum, we're both children of alcoholics. But there's something else we have in common, which is perhaps more important. <laughs> and I hope, I, I hope this isn't going to embarrass you or, or your mum, and I'm sorry. We're both actually children of Playboy Bunny Girls. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> this is actually true. I think that's just a good thing. And the reason, I, the reason I mention this is not to embarrass you or, 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 or your mum, I do apologise, I'm so sorry, but, is that my dad was a croupier in the Man Manchester Playboy Casino. My mum was a bunny girl in the Manchester Playboy uh, in the 1970s. And I think your dad and my dad must have crossed paths at some point. They must have done. The day before Callum was, was coming to Bristol, they, they did tell me who it was. Um, and so I asked Cassie to show me you know, on, you know, photograph, you know, just so I knew that, because they were going to do this staged meeting thing, and I thought, wouldn't it be awful if I didn't recognise him? So Cassie showed me lots of photographs, and you were just everywhere, Callum. 
And there were some photographs of you with a lot, um, I, I think it was Celebrity Island or something, and it was really <laughs> funny, and I, I was really nervous about meeting you, I have to say. But I also have to say that that was not the Callum I met, and it's also not the Callum I know. Although I do want to say that when Callum does some of these things, he gives the fee to us, so I'm really grateful that you still do things like come dine with me. But the Callum I met that day was someone who uh, went on stage and opened the Urban Paint Festival, which is a largest urban paint festival in Europe um, and we're their charity partner another great great story um, not knowing anyone Callum came down bless his heart uh, stood on stage talked a bit about things and then later found that lots of people were going up to him and saying me too we all hear this me too when we start talking about this um, the, the TV company then staged um, us talking to each other in a bar, do you remember? Mm. And um, we started talking, and I don't think we stopped for about an hour. Um, and, it, I, I, and it's one of the uh, moments, of, one of the epiphany moments of my life when I was listening to you and we were talking and it was, what came into my head was, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how famous your dad is. It doesn't matter how much money you've got or how poor you are or nothing matters. It's all the same. And then another thought came, which was, I was really glad you couldn't read my mind because I didn't want you to think that I was there for the, oh, it's all just the same. It wasn't that, but it really was a moment. Um, and that is 10 years ago. And Callum's been with us ever since, and I, and I cannot tell you how much prestige he brings with him, um, how many people get in touch with us and say things like, I heard Callum talking, he's given me the courage to talk out loud. He's opened the doors to a huge number of people who probably would never have thought it was okay to talk about this stuff. So I, I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am to him, or actually how much I love you. Yeah. Um, really, because you know you've been amazing. <laughs> and what you've also done, because it's not this is Nico has not been an easy road. What you've also done is, and you will not know this, is that in moments of despair, no money, not knowing, you know, never being able to plan anything, not being able to invest in staff, there are moments when I bring people to mind and think. If they believe in this work and they know from the inside, then this is really good. And you're one of those people for me. So thank you, Callum, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Wonderful. It's an honor to be here 10 years later. Um, I'm very flattered and honored to be a patron to Nicola. Um, I, I can't think of anything I'd rather do than help you spread the word and everybody spread the word that could help potentially change children's lives. Um, I remember 10 years ago when I first became a patron to Nicola, um, Hillary said, will you come down and do a talk at a dinner? And I was mortified. I was like, oh, how am I going to do this? I've never spoke about this before. You know, everybody knows how scary it is to open up and I show up, no idea what's going to happen. I walk into the Battersea, Batter, Battersea Power Station, 2,000 people, <laughs> and it's like 7 p.m. and I get to the front and everybody's drinking. And I'm going, how do I deliver this message? <laughs> Everybody is drinking. But we did the best we could do. And I suppose the point of that story is to now see how much that has progressed in 10 years to now be in the House of Commons in front of a full house with all of these people spreading the good word. It's an honor to take part of that as well. So well done, everybody. I'll keep, I'll keep this quite short, but for me, I had to tell a full personal story. I couldn't miss anything out when discussing what I went through at being the son of a child of an alcoholic. With the platform that I had, the father that I had, I had to speak the truth. Um, some people didn't like it, some people understood it. Um, and recently, um, I tried to talk about the moment and the help that is there for going forward, not talking about the past. But when Children of Alcoholics Week comes along, I really use that moment to get the full story out of how much Trauma can be involved, and recently I did a piece for a 
Sky News, and uh, I wore my heart on my sleeve. And I thought about if I would say this or not, but those who understood, understood. But I got a lot of negative feedback from that. And it actually made me a bit, <clears throat> a bit nervous, a bit worried. But I spoke to Hillary, and it actually then turned, and it inspired me to show that those that don't understand do not understand. And people mm -hmm. like us need to help them and guide them, explain to them how serious of a matter this is. And it inspired me, me to never stop doing it and to come here today and want to speak up in front of everybody to help them help others understand as well. And uh, the flip side to that is I also know it's really working well. My social media is a huge platform for me to speak my mind. Every single day for the past six years that I've had social media, at least three messages a day come through from kids, young adults, and adults asking advice or pointers of where they could go. I always direct them to NACOA, but it just shows me for six years, literally every single day someone's reached out and looked for help. So the more we talk, the more we advise, the more we point in the right direction. And right now, there's a huge shift in mindfulness. I know there's a generation that want to stop that drink throughout their hereditary line. And I'm happy to stop it myself right now. And I know there's others that want to do the same thing. <clears throat> so I'll end it on a bit of a universal one. The universe sent me this little message today when I was on my way here. <laughs> and it, it was a quote. And it said, the person that plants the seed to a tree that will not see its shade is starting to understand the meaning of life. And it made me realize we have to keep all planting these seeds for the 2.6 million kids out there and the future generations. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Callum? You were first. appreciate that and, and that is a lot to do with some like-minded individuals that understand what it is. Um, for me my situation is very unique if I'm honest with you. I had a father that was an icon and a hero to many people and a lot of people don't want to know that their hero did bad. And it, but that they felt that my words were against but for me no matter, that first of all they're not, my, my father's biggest fan but there's such a bigger picture than just a father and a dad. It's the whole I have a platform he would have wanted me to do good with it, and it might sound me, 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 but if I have a position and an outreach, I'm gonna help try to make a change with it. Some people didn't want to know about the putting, putting somebody to pass down, but I think these people, all due respect, need to know that there's a bigger picture to it, and if we could open their eyes to that, then I think that's the message. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.